Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McDaniel, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in studio is... Jason Rosenbaum. And... Joe Manis. And our special guest this week... State Representative Jeff Rorda. He is the other half of the Battle for Jeffco, as Jason has dubbed it. <laughs> yes! Another person is referring to the racist... <laughs> you left the hashtag out. <laughs> of the hashtag Battle I just for think Jeffco. that's such a neat thing to call this race but i'm i'm a weird person so okay you said it first (laughs) yes so So, last week we had on your opponent and and this week we're going to have you on um like your opponent you are a current representative so why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about your district and he's a democrat from you are a democrat democrat from barnhart Barnhart, yes and uh have been in the the state house of representatives for eight years i'll be term limited At the end of this year, and I saw this uh, open Senate seat as an opportunity to continue my public service, Chris. I mean, uh, I've spent my entire adult life uh, in public service, started as a volunteer firefighter when I was 18, Uh, went on to be a 911 dispatcher and a police officer for 17 years, served on our local fire board, our local ambulance board, and, uh, you know, there's not been a minute of my adult life where I haven't been serving the community where my my wife and and I are raising our three daughters. Well, tell us a little bit about why you decided to run for state representative. I guess your first campaign was in 2004. Is that correct? First it of was, all? yes. Why did you decide to take the leap into the state level? You know, I'd always uh, been very interested in politics. I come from a mixed marriage. My my mom is a Kennedy Democrat. My dad is an Eisenhower <laughs> Republican. Well, that might explain your and, voting uh, record a little bit. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, conversations around the dinner table were lively. I remember uh, being nine years old and arguing with my dad about Watergate. And, uh, you know, when when the House seat was, was suddenly vacant because Ryan McKenna decided he wasn't going to run again, I talked to my wife and my family and, and uh, shared my interest in running and, and saw it as, as really a, a good time in my life to do it and uh, jumped in a three-way primary and, and, and won – uh, the primary and the and the general, but very close numbers. So you you, you then spent I think three terms in the House. Mm-hmm. Um, I what was kind of your, your life like in the legislature then? Because it was a kind of a time of you know all Republican rule. Sure. The governor was Matt Blunt, right? And it seemed like things were a lot more combative between the two parties. Is that a fair assessment? I, I think it. I think that's fair. I mean, I I think we're in a more um, uh, divisive political climate uh, in the last decade or so, um, not just here in in Missouri, but in Washington, D.C., too. And I, it, it really makes me sad to see uh, Jefferson City looking more and more like Washington, D.C., because I don't think that the voters that I talk to uh, every day uh, like the way uh, politics operate in, in Washington. Do you want to be a little more specific in what's going on in, in Jefferson City that makes you think it's like Washington, D.C., just for our listeners? Just just the partisan rancor. I mean, uh, you, you can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, you know, I I don't get sucked into that as much because, uh, frankly, the, the thing that's the most important to me is is having a safe community, you know, with my given my public safety background, I spend a lot of time, time uh passing legislation and, and helping with legislation that 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 makes Jefferson County and the whole state safer. You know, the, the Republican chairman of, of the Public Safety Committee for, for, I guess, about the first six years I was there, Mark Bruns and I are best of friends. I was the, the ranking Democrat most of that time, and we worked very closely to pass a lot of legislation, and I think the state's better for it. But I don't think that's emblematic of the way the legislature operates on a daily basis. I, I do have to ask you about one incident during your first tenure in the legislature mm-hmm. with uh, Tim Jones. We actually asked him about this when he was on the podcast the first time. It's this a very, is that current House speaker. Uh, it was a very memorable blow-up between sure. you two. Can you kind of explain what happened well, there? Well, um, we were debating the budget, uh, and you know that's always one of the most hotly contested um, uh, debates that that we have in the in the house. And, now, was he even majority leader then? Or no, what was he, his was, he was just uh, his... he was a fellow representative then. He was okay. the chairman of the rules. So this committee. was like what two thousand eight, two thousand nine or ten. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go um, ahead. So uh, you know, I was speaking on the house floor, and you know, we we have rules of of decorum in the house. I was speaking. Uh, Tim chose to start screaming and interrupt me. The the speaker. Uh, let it go on for a while, and I finally said to Tim, I said, if you got something to say, go to a microphone and seek to be recognized. And 
he just blew up. He had to be restrained. He had to be removed from the chamber. Um, you know, uh, I think that the folks that want to make more out of that than than really happened try to make it look like I did something wrong, but I was I was following the rules, and 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 Tim wasn't. You can look it up on YouTube. It's a highly entertaining video, including <laughs> uh, Ron Richard asking where Ralph was. That's the "Where's Ralph? Where's Ralph?" is is sort of a, a recurring uh, quote in in the house. Yes, we're absolutely. En- well, engaging in levity. Okay, so you lost to Whelan in 2010, and then you got yep. a seat back, but in different district in yep. 2012. And one of the things that's been noteworthy when I've been in the chambers is that you sort of have a Jeopardy finger, and that and that. There's been a couple key mm-hmm. votes where you've been on one side, and then there had been, like, right when they're putting down the— because this happened during veto it session, yep. where you switched the vote, and all of a sudden it was killed because you, <laughs> you switched the vote. Well, and, you know, I think people sent us to Jefferson City to be relevant. Uh, that You're talking about this uh, deer hunting bill yeah, that deer would hunting bill this decimated time. deer hunting in Missouri. Uh, every conservation group agrees uh, that the 20,000 hunters in Jefferson County— uh, would have had a lot more trouble finding a healthy deer uh, if that bill had passed. I mean, that was a no-brainer for me. I'm I'm glad to have uh, taken part in, in killing what was a terrible bill. But what prompted you to do it that way? Just for our listeners, no. He was a yes vote. Until... I was never a yes. But well, I, no, I, no, I, no, I, no, I was, no, 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 yeah, no. Right, right. During the veto, yeah. and then right as they were closing the board, he switched it to no, and because he was the crucial vote that was needed, all of a sudden it was dead, and Twitter went crazy. Right. <laughs> Yeah, because well, they would have gone out in twisted arms and, and, and broken fingers to get that 109th vote. And uh, I wanted that bill to fail, and, and I used a, a parliamentary maneuver to, to see that it was. And that's that's what you get with me. You get a guy that can make a difference. And with Paul, you get a guy that just sort of warms the seat and can't get much done. Well, I do want to ask you kind of about your your votes kind of in your fourth term, because Mm -hmm. a lot of people have noticed that you've been voting with Republicans on certain bills. Now, some of the times it was bills related to Jeffco, like the Dill Run bill, which I think makes sense because other Jeffco people did as well. But you've also voted for the following bills, and I just wrote that down just to make sure I'm right, at least in the regular session. Mm -hmm. You voted for the tax cut both in 2013 and 2014 right. in the regular session. You voted for the gun nullification bill. You voted for a bill aimed at eradicating Sharia law. You voted for the 72-hour waiting period, both in the session and during veto session. And you also voted for a multifaceted firearms bill. Mm-hmm. These are all bills that your party has used to castigate Republicans as extremists. So I have two questions, first of all. Sure. Have you become more conservative in your fourth term in order to win this Senate seat? And two, are you undermining your party by voting for all these bills? Well, first, uh, I think my record's been consistently conservative on social issues my entire eight years. Uh, there's, you know, there's been no change uh, in the way I voted on, on social issues, and I think it's reflective not only of my personal beliefs about uh, gun owners' rights and uh, reproductive issues, uh, I think it's very reflective of of my district. Uh, I I don't apologize for representing uh, the the folks that uh, that sent me to office, and and that's who I serve. I don't serve a political party. I serve the the thirty seven thousand constituents that sent me to Jefferson City as a state rep, and I'll do the same thing with the hundred seventy thousand folks that uh, I hope to send me to Jeff City as their state senator. Has that called a, caused a problem at all with some of the Democratic leadership because you've been at odds with no, them on I a number think, of issues? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I I think that uh, we are the big tent party. I think there's plenty of room in our party for people that have uh, closely held social beliefs um, and personal beliefs. And I've never been disciplined for it. As a matter of fact, I was elected minority whip in 2000. Nine by my house colleagues, uh, and um, you know, I, I was part of a of a ma- minority leadership team where where all three of us were were mm-hmm. were pro life and and had pretty good conservative bona fides on uh, on on gun ownership. But I mean, as I kind of mentioned before, some major leaders in your party, mm-hmm. including Senator McCaskill. Chris Coster, have used these bills to attack Republicans. And then when you see a high-profile state Senate candidate like yourself voting for it, you're saying that doesn't undermine the overall message of your party? Well, I'm not in charge of messaging for my party. If I was, uh, we'd be talking a lot more about 
about job creation and uh, keeping our public schools um, at the top level they operate at for 99% of the state. We've got great public schools that do a great job for their community. We spend an awful lot of time talking about the 1% that don't. Uh, but, uh, you know, those are the things I care about, keeping our community safe, good public schools, uh, putting people to work. Now, in, in the contest, I've already gotten some calls on mm-hmm. some things. Uh, just so our listeners know, you are a former policeman, and you right. also are business manager for the St. Louis Police Officers right. Association. Right. They don't pay us enough that we don't, can't have, <laughs> don't have to have a day job. Yes. Yeah. So, But I have, I've gotten emails or calls from people who talk about your police record as far as when you're a policeman. Uh, yeah. Apparently... The Republicans are circulating some stuff about that. Right. They try, they've tried that attack say? every time, Joe, um, and it's it's never stuck because the people in Jefferson County know uh, what a hero I was when it when it came to exposing a corrupt police administration in the city of Arnold. I mean, uh, I was fired for filing a false police report uh, regarding the police chief and the assistant chief there, and uh, eventually those two were fired for uh, the exact same charges that I brought to brought to uh, the public eye. And in the meantime, I was hired as a police chief at the neighboring police department. So, I mean, if if Republicans are, are going to uh, bet all their money on, on that attack, then I'd, I'd say I welcome it because Jefferson County voters know that uh, I did the right thing there and that I do the right thing every day. So let's kind of segue into this, mm-hmm. this contest, um, sure. the, the so-called battle for Jeffco, which is I'm appearing more lame with every time I say it. Um, so you're running against Representative Whelan. Yes. It's kind of a rematch of 2010, except on a state Senate level. And, you know, one of the things I noticed early on is you raised considerably more money th- than him. But he has gotten an influx of money from the, the, the basically the Senate state. Republican group, mm-hmm. Correct. which which I, I think you probably expected. I sure, certainly I expected yeah. it. So it basically means that you have two candidates with roughly the same amount of money that are probably going to have enough resources to, you know, send oodles of mailers to people, go on the radio, go on TV. It's almost like a mini congressional race. So what do you see as the main issues here? And how do you kind of navigate this type of race, which is arguably the most competitive in the state? Well, first of all, it's a very different uh, election in 2010. In 2010, uh, we had a, a year where where working folks just stayed home. I I was surprised to hear Paul say that on his show. He he credited the closure of of the Fenton Chrysler plant and the economic depression that followed with him winning in 2010, which is an extraordinarily interesting and candid uh, view of that election. But 2010 was obviously a watershed Republican year. We don't see that happening again. Uh, We had a uh, congressional race at the top of the ticket, which was uh, very lopsided in Jefferson County. Uh, we had working families stay home uh, this this year. Uh, labor unions and other other working family groups are very motivated to get voters to poll. And then 2010, the the House seat was was and is the most Republican House seat in the county. Um, the Senate seat uh, is a much more Democratic seat. 39 out of the last 40 years, it's been in Democratic hands and in the hands of of. Jay Nixon and Steve Stoll and Jack Gannon and Bill McKenna and Ryan McKenna, uh, just this long lineage of moderate, uh, common sense, democratic leaders, and I, I fit in that same mold. And and, and Paul is Paul is in a very different mold. Paul uh, joins in a radical agenda uh, that uh, you know I think when we talk about it with voters um, in the six weeks before this election. Uh, they're going to see a, a bright contrast when it comes to um, how we treat seniors and children. Specifically, and, what are those things that you would differentiate between? Well, I mean, I, let's take, for instance, uh, this uh, last year we had a vote on uh, cutting the circuit breaker, making deep cuts to the circuit breaker, which is a, a tax relief plan for seniors. It's a very popular uh, plan that uh, is widely um popular with, with, with seniors and, and people that are sympathetic to seniors. We've all got grandparents. Uh, Paul voted to gut that uh, tax credit and and literally 10 minutes later voted to spend $50 million in taxpayers' money uh, to renovate his office and other offices in the state capitol. I mean, that, that sort of out-of-stride 
um, approach to politics is not going to fare well in a place like Jefferson County where people care about seniors retiring with dignity and, and people care about uh, fiscal responsibility. Um, you know, and I, 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 I don't know what goes through a guy's mind when he casts a vote like that, but it's certainly not reflective of Jefferson County values. Now, one of the things that Rep- Representative Whelan said during uh, our show with him is that he did highlight um, his support for labor positions on several key measures, such as he opposed right to work, he opposed uh, the so-called paycheck protection, which would allow, which would bar um, payroll deduction sure. for union dues, uh, things like that, which appeared to me as in a, he was trying to break with his party on that and in part to let union members know that he's not so uh, um, alien or opposed to them. How do you, you are a union member, right. how do you um, counter that? Well, I, I've I've voted with unions um, and working families on every issue. Uh, Paul has drifted back and forth. Um, every labor union uh, that has endorsed in this race has endorsed me. Uh, so I, I think the line is a bright line there as well. You know, Paul Paul voted uh, for things like gutting workman's comp and voted against uh, the minimum wage. Again, these are just sort of common sense, uh, really basic value statements that uh, that Paul just reflects over and over again that he doesn't understand Jefferson County values. But what for what what are Jefferson County values by the way? It's it's a very blue collar community. Um folks go to church on Sunday and they go to work on Monday and uh they expect to have a legislator that that supports uh working families and uh has respect for seniors and veterans and uh and wants to make Missouri and Jefferson County a, a better place to live and uh you know I I got a record I'm pretty proud of on that front and uh Paul's a a nice guy and uh he's a nice guy right up until the time that you look at his voting record and and uh he doesn't look so nice then. Well, we asked we asked him this, and we figure it's it's fair to ask you this as well. How would you characterize your relationship with Representative Wheeland? As a very cordial one, you know. As as I said, uh, you know, we see each other in public. We're at the same events all the time, and uh, you know, I stopped to talk to his wife and and Paul uh, s- last Sunday at the Arnold Days picnic, and and we always exchange pleasantries. And I served with uh, his dad on the ambulance board for four years. Very nice gentleman. Uh, but again, you know, Paul is a nice guy right up until the time you see his voting record. And I think deep down he knows how out of a line his voting record is with Jefferson County values. And he just doesn't have the political courage to stand up to his party, which, you know, you just by guys just pointed out that when I when I differ with my party, I have the courage to, to stand up and be counted. Now, he has uh, been involved in this lawsuit, mm-hmm. uh, which is basically a challenging the Affordable Care Act. Uh, where do you stand, A, on Medicaid expansion, B, is there anything you want to say about his lawsuit, which well, is basically— And what's your take yeah. on the contraception mandate? Correct. Well, I, it was interesting to see Paul unable to demonstrate a, a understanding the difference between birth control and bacon uh, on your show. Um, and, I mean, I, I think that he also fails to demonstrate an understanding of the difference between birth control and abortion. You know, I oppose elective abortion, but I understand that there should be a— exception for rape, incest, and and the life of the mother. Paul holds a very different radical view on that, and he he calls uh, basic forms of birth control in his lawsuit intrinsically evil. And, uh, you know, the 90 percent of women in Jefferson County that uh, use birth control probably find that a bit offensive. Um, Is that going to be an issue or not? Well, I mean, he's decided to make it one. He's uh, he's asking the courts uh, to help him raise his kids and to to. Um, I, I I mean, I have conversa- frank conversations with my daughters about uh, birth control and abstinence, and uh, I think that should stay in our living room. I don't think we have to take that in a courtroom. While we're on the topic of the Affordable Care Act, what are your thoughts on Medicaid expansion? Yes. Well, let's, first of all, there you know, again, Paul and and some people with radical views can't can't distinguish between Obamacare and Medicaid. You know, Medicaid is a great program that's worked very well for fifty years, and for us to turn back a billion dollars a year in tax money that we s- sent to the federal government that they want to 
sent back to our state and our county to create jobs, 24,000 new jobs by, by most accounts, um, and instead send that money to New York and California just doesn't make any economic sense to me. I mean, Paul spent most of your program talking about taking credit for work he didn't do on the port. The only thing Paul did was get money in the budget in the House that got stripped out in the Senate. Uh, that's been his only contribution to the port. Uh, but, I mean, if he really cares about creating jobs, there's no better opportunity for us than, than to expand Medicaid and, and accept our own tax dollars back uh, and create that 24,000 jobs and all the ancillary jobs that come, come with it and all the ancillary economic activity that comes with it. I do have one more question, though, on the lawsuit. You just mm-hmm. mentioned that you oppose abortion with the, the exception of, of rape, incest, or life of the mother. Yes. Yet you did just vote to not only pass but override the 72-hour waiting period, which mm-hmm. did not have that exception and which a lot of people on – the pro-choice side or the pro-abortion right side criticized. Right. Is that inconsistent with that view? No, I mean, I, so I, I think a 72-hour wait period is a good idea. We uh, had an amendment to uh, to create an exception for uh, rape and incest. There was a Democrat that, that uh, offered that. I wrote it, uh, and they strong-armed him into to, uh, withdrawing the amendment. I, I would have like that bill a lot better if there was an exception. Uh, but I think that the courts would strike down any uh, any attempt to uh, enforce a 72-hour in the case of rape and incest. And I think on balance, uh, getting that on the law, is, was, getting that on the books uh, was a positive step for for abortion. Now, while it has become an issue because his lawsuit, there's also the other matter even though Jefferson even though Ferguson is not in Jefferson mm-hmm. County it's in St. Louis County it's become an issue in your race at least according to some because as um business manager for the St. Louis Police Officer Association also you're on the board of this of the oh, fraternal the order police, of police the police charity yeah yeah the charity arm mm-hmm. which handles shield of uh, hope yeah, shield of hope yeah yeah which handles uh raising money for various police who are in dire circumstances mm-hmm. for various reasons. Right. And Surviving case, widows, orphans. Yep. And in this case, you guys have been raising money and taking over another independent charity to help Darren Wilson, the Ferguson police officer who's at the center of the whole issue of the right. police shooting. Do you want to talk about that at all? And some have also linked that with the whole thing of whether or not your support. They've even brought in Bob McCullough into this, even though he's yeah. the prosecutor in St. Louis I think County. That, I think that's a bit of a stretch. You know, I, I try to keep my day job and my legislative career separate. Uh, but in this case, you know, my opinion is the same in both places. We, I believe in trial by jury, not trial by riot. I think that, uh, I think that uh, Officer Wilson has a right to have a fair trial. Uh, as a member of the Fraternal Order of Police, he has the benefit of, of legal protection and— uh, it's going to be an expensive, uh, long ride for him, and uh, the charity chose to accept money for that purpose. And I don't, uh, I don't disagree with that. You know, uh, Paul and his supporters have have tried to attack me for my role in that police charity, and uh, I don't think, again, I think that's out of stride with Jefferson County voters. You know, I, it's one of the issues I hear about the most on doors. People are worried about. Uh, their safety. They're worried about the rule of law in the wake of uh, the riots in Ferguson. And uh, universally, uh, folks in Jefferson County support my position on this. Now, you say you try to keep your day job and your legislative uh, career separate, but they do intersect. And, and sure they do. This just, like, just like Paul, uh, Paul being an insurance man and, and carrying right. the water for sure. insurance special interest. So, so this this session, you sponsored a bill that would have kept. The identity of police officers involved in shootings, mm-hmm. secret, uh, not subject to Missouri Sunshine Law. I believe you stepped back from that bill. Um, tell me a little bit about at what point did you decide that this bill wasn't a good idea? Well, I never said I didn't think it was a good idea. Uh, I think that I thought I read officers, that you were stepping back yeah. from this bill. Uh, well, we reached a compromise on this that uh, the St. Louis Police Department wouldn't release the name of officers unless – they had first gone through a threat assessment uh, in the intelligence division to make sure that releasing their name didn't put them in some uh, grave danger. Uh, I think that's a good compromise, and I and I'm happy to to leave it at that and not uh, 
attempt to move the bill forward. But I, you know, just on a higher level, I think police officers, uh, just like any other citizen, shouldn't have their name drug through the mud if uh, if they're not con- they're not charged with a crime. I mean, uh, if you shoot somebody, your name doesn't get released. Uh, unless you're charged with a crime. And I right, but think, Chris isn't an employee yeah. of the state. I mean, if, if a somebody in a local government shoots somebody, shouldn't people have the right to know who did to, it? To what end? I mean, I mean, why, why is that unreasonable? Well, because, they, because we just saw a police officer being tried in the court of public opinion uh, mm-hmm. rather than us waiting for the facts of, of that case. Um, you know, so I, I, I think... What happened is more important than who was involved. I mean, that's okay. just my basic view of it. Now, the last time I talked to you about the charitable fund, mm-hmm. you guys were holding off on raising any more money until you got a legal opinion on whether right. or not the money could be used for the legal defense. That's right. Have you gotten an opinion? No, we, we're still kind of waiting for the multitude of, of people that are looking yeah. at to so, give us an opinion. So has any of that money gone to Darren Wilson yet? No. None of it. None of the. None of the. Uh, so this was like over four hundred thousand, and none of it's right. gone to Wilson. Well, yet. The, now I'll, I don't know what's happened with the money that the young girl raised. She she hasn't, um, she hasn't turned that over the shield of hope. I don't know that she has or hasn't provided any any uh, financial help to uh, Officer Wilson, but not through the shield of hope. Now, you mentioned that Republicans were trying to make it an issue mm-hmm. in this race, and. Although Representative Whelan says he's not going to, I wouldn't be surprised if they did make hay of this. But you know, I hope they do. I mean, it's it's again, it's completely contrary to to the values of folks in Jefferson County. But I have noticed that some African American Democrats have been absolutely incensed by your role in this, and I'm sure that you've talked with some of your legislative colleagues about this. Um, I don't know what impact that's going to have on this race, but. I mean, what's been the reaction from some people who see this as inappropriate, potentially? Uh, well, I didn't hear from you. Know, I thought I would maybe have some conversations like that during veto session. The uh, African-American members of my caucus that I talked to said, hey, I understand where you're coming from and why you're doing what you're doing. I hope you understand uh, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I mean, th- those are the conversations I had. I, I didn't see any incense um, or anger, uh, just uh, sort of... Mutual understanding. Mm-hmm. Now, there's been a. They've kind of brought Bob McCullough's name in it. Any chance that you're going to bring be bringing McCullough to Jefferson County to Should campaign I for you? Have him come down to stump for me. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting it. I'm just <laughs> reporting. I'm just asking. Hey, I, I think Bob's going to be pretty busy for he, the next couple. You months. You know, he's stumped for Coster and Steve Stanger to great success. So maybe he could stump for you as well. Yep. I think I think he's going to be pretty busy the next couple of months. So I noticed you're really sunburned. Is there a particular reason from well, door I mean, to door or I'm what? Mostly from door to door. I mean, Arnold Days was a, a, a not a cloud in the sky, and I was down there, uh, you know, all weekend at Arnold Days, which is a big event in our community, and uh, it was just a cool day, and and you didn't realize how hot you were getting. So I think I got a little more sunburnt than I normally am. Now, in a, in a place like Jefferson County, does mm-hmm. Social media play much at all in a race like that, or is it more traditional stuff like mailers and door to door and walking I, I hear, in I hear the hashtag Battle for Jeffco has just been really <laughs> it's taken off it's like been wildfire, taken off. sort of like Quigley Mania. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I think it's growing. I think it's the same everywhere. I mean, we're it's it's mostly suburban uh, community, uh, so everybody has access to the internet. You know, the southwest corner there's still some agricultural areas down there, but. Most of the district's a, a suburban area where, where people get a lot of information on the Internet, and we, uh, we have a robust uh, communications plan to, to talk to voters uh, on the Internet, and we've been doing that uh, for, for months now. How much of an impact do you think that there might be? I've talked to some other Republicans and, and, and Democrats about this. The fact that there's no Democratic state auditor candidate at the top mm-hmm. of the ticket, so basically— the first tier of Democrats are people running for the state Senate right. and St. Louis County Executive. Uh, does that affect your race in any way? I think it helps me. I mean, I think I think in a low turnout race when there's not a marquee uh, race at the top of the ticket, that the the, uh, the turnout favors the candidate that works the hardest. And, and I don't think anyone that watches this election has any doubt that I'm the candidate with the, the, the work ethic and, and the— uh, the guy that's getting out there knocking. I mean, I, I've i not heard of anybody that's had Paul Whelan come to their door. Um, you know, we've been on 
cable TV since the day after the primary. Uh, as I said, we're, we have a robust um, online presence, and uh, we're still waiting for Paul to talk to the first voter in this race. But, uh, you know, we've been communicating with them, and, and the reinforcement that we get at the doors and, and in our communication with voters is that our message is, is right on and is reflective of uh, of our community. Do you think one of the, the double-edged swords of that, though, is the fact that Auditor Schweik doesn't have an opponent and the fact that a number of state Senate candidates that were opposed in 2010 don't have opponents could mean that more money flows to your opponent than had they been opposed by a reasonably strong candidate? I don't know of any Democratic Senate race that's gotten any more money from fellow Democrats than, than mine has. I mean, maybe uh, the Shoup Ashcroft yeah, race, yeah, potentially. I, mean, I see, I see it's them both. It's been kind pretty of equal. even, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot more resources coming to both sides because there's uh, no top of the ticket to speak of, so at least on the statewide level. So I. Uh, obviously, uh, Republicans have a lot more special interest money to, to uh, launder for their candidates, um, and, and the money coming in in big chunks from the Republican Party is bigger than what's coming in mm-hmm. from the Democratic Party. But uh, at the same time, you know, when Paul has a fundraiser, it's it's him and, and uh, two two guys in dark suits from the Republican <laughs> Party uh, passing checks across the state. When I have one, it's 150 people uh, writing small checks and investing in a campaign they believe they all buy the same thing though they well, all buy ads well, and mailers that's right that's now, right the governor was uh in jefferson county mm-hmm. last week for you the same day he was also up in uh, 24th district for jill right. shoop uh does the governor's presence help or hurt him mean, he's originally from jeffco but again with you bucking the party on some things including voting to override some of his vetoes did that did that cause any problems in getting him to come down to raise money for you or how how would you characterize that uh, I, I you know I, i've had a great relationship with jay over the years uh you know i i uh have had his back on an awful lot of issues and and when we disagree he's uh he's a gentleman about it and, and seems to understand that, that we just have a a, a basic ideological uh, difference on the matter i mean i i don't know of anybody in the state legislature that's uh, had a better relationship with with Governor Nixon than I have, and uh, you know I've I've told him when I disagree with him, I did, I disagree with the way he's handled Ferguson in some respects. How and so? I've told him. How so? Uh, I think that uh, that uh, bringing in uh, the state patrol uh, was a mistake. Um, I think uh, bringing them in to help would have been a good idea, but bringing them in to take over was. Uh, very deflating to local law enforcement. St. Louis County uh, was doing a good job, and uh, I think it was. Uh, um, I don't think it was a good time for second guessing. Now I, we've asked this to a lot of guests, mm-hmm. and I, if you win, and yep. since you do have a law enforcement background, I do think that there's going to be some issues related to Ferguson that are so come too. up. We've talked with people about municipal court reform, which I think is a definite possibility. And I'm all in favor of. And we're talking about potentially police cameras, which I know you have a different opinion on. What would you want to do in the state Senate to respond to this in kind of your experience as a law enforcement yeah, officer? I, would, I, I think a, a dialogue between law enforcement and uh, and um, the African-American community in particular, but just the uh, sort of underprivileged community that, uh, that there's a sort of a... Uh, a chasm between law enforcement and the, and the inner city sort of population. I, I think we need to bridge that gap, and I, I think I'm an important uh, voice in that conversation. I, I look forward to sitting across the table from my colleagues and trying to uh, make uh, Missouri a better place through uh, a, a long-needed conversation between uh, those two populations. Why, why do you think that you're uh, uh, the best person to be part of that conversation? I mean, you come from a place that's like 97% white. I mean, how can you relate to, to people who are African-American? Well, because nobody understands law enforcement better than I do in the Missouri legislature. And because I've, I've worked in, uh, you know, I, I did five years undercover narcotics, spent a lot of time in, uh, in St. Louis working with uh, the DEA and customs and, and city narcotics uh, on cases that that affected the whole region, and and I, um, I, I think I understand uh, both sides of the issue. Mm-hmm. 
Well, this is definitely a race, and, and Ferguson is definitely an issue that we will be covering extensively, yes. and you can read all of those stories on stlpublicradio.org. And I'll make this promise right here and then. The winner of this race will get to come back to the show as okay. the senator. <laughs> so well, now I, now I really have something well, to strive for. Now that's, there's an incentive for oh, you to win this or race. Or maybe not an incentive. Yeah. <laughs> if you thought the battle was heated before, now now it's really— <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we call it the battle for—, for N- NPR. <laughs> yeah. That's a battle that you can't win. <laughs> to close us out here, you can follow me on Twitter at, at CS McDaniel. Jason. J. Rosenbaum. And Joe. Uh, J. Manis. That's J M A N N I E S. And do you have a Twitter as well? Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. And the uh, the website is, is uh, jeffrorda.org. And I believe your handle is Rorda J, if I'm not mistaken. Rorda J. That's so. right. That's right. We'll be back next week. Until then, so long.